Welcome back to the Timeless Watch channel guys. This time coming to you from Padova in North Italy and arguably one of the spots where modern timekeeping, accurate timekeeping at least, began. Uh, right above my left shoulder here, way up in that tower at the very top, sat a gentleman about 400 years ago by the name of Galileo Galilei. And from there, he made some of the uh, most important observations in modern science. A lot of people consider him the father of modern science. He made breakthroughs in astronomy, of course, and uh, geometry, including one that really uh, applies to us as watch people, and that is uh, his observation of how pendulums swing and the time it takes from a for a pendulum to swing from one side to another, never changing no matter how high you drop it from. And of course he applied pendulums into clocks. Uh, if you take a look at a grandfather clock, one of those large clocks that you, you see in like a big old house or something like that, you'll see that underneath the clock itself, way down in the body of the clock, you'll see a big heavy pendulum there. Well, that's uh, thanks to Galileo. Uh, he figured out that if he connected the pendulum to the escapement that it would, uh, uh, help keep accurate time and in fact it improved the accuracy of timekeeping uh, by leaps and bounds. Now of course we're still using the same uh, principles today in mechanical watches at least, not with pendulums of course but with a spring balance but essentially it's the same theory and the same application of his uh, theories in mathematics and geometry. So it kind of all started right up there at the top of that tower if you can believe it, kind of amazing. So I'm going to have a look around Padova while I'm here. There's some cool watch stores here and uh, I'm going to actually do a review of a watch you've seen in some of my other videos uh, that I've been wearing sometimes and that is my 116613 Submariner, the two-tone one with the uh, black dial and black bezel. It's one of my favorite watches and I haven't really spoken about it very much so I figured I'd better do a review on it and why not do it here in Padova. So let's do it. must be great when it's snowing because all the streets no matter where you go for miles and miles it's just under all these arcades so it's <laughs> it's really cool you're outside but you're kind of protected by the buildings themselves above your head One of the oldest towns in all of Italy. It's like 3,000 years old. It's home to the oldest university or the second oldest university I believe and the oldest medical school in Italy. It's like uh, back in the 1200s or something like that it was when it was... Look, look at this. It's just... just arcades everywhere <laughs> for miles and miles. This is spooky. It's kind of spooky. Padova is often referred to as the city of the three withouts, la città delle tre senza. It doesn't really translate to English well, but what it means is there are a few things missing in the city. So you have the lawn with no grass, the saint with no name, and the cafe with no doors. 
it's a bit funky like that. The lawn with no grass is Prato, Prato de la Valle, which is an enormous lawn field area, but it, it's got no grass in it. It's just all concrete, you know? And the saint with no name is actually San Antonio, St. Anthony. That's where I am right now. I'm right inside the grounds of the, of the cathedral here. Uh, so he does have a name, but they don't use his name. They just say the saint. Hey, I'll meet you over by the saint. Hey, now what about that bar near the saint? They're referring to the cathedral of uh, San Antonio. And the last one is the um, cafe with no doors, which is the Pedrocchi. I'm going to go have a look at that next. It's got no doors because it was always open. It has doors now. They're made of glass, but historically it was always open. This is another of the famous Padova withouts, the horse without its rider. Here's another thing that's missing. See the uh, center of this arch here behind me? Uh, notice it doesn't have a pillar coming down to support it. Well, that's the missing pillar. Uh, apparently they never put it there, but they claimed that it was actually stolen by the people of the nearby town of Vicenza. The Vicentini had actually stolen the center of their, their column. Like, that's the thing you steal. But uh, that was supposed to kind of instigate conflict and war between the two cities. F***ing Padova, I mean, man. Looks like the folks here at Louis Vuitton have been doing their homework about Galileo. Check out their window. That is a pendulum and a photo of Neptune. Well, at least they did their homework. From what I hear, it's kind of stuffy and a little bit cold inside. It's not the Pedrocchi it used to be. It was closed for a very long time. It was reopened about 20 years ago and uh, still remains one of the great staples of Padova. One thing that's uh, very notable outside are the lions, uh, the big lions figures. Pretty much every Padovano, anyone who's grown up in Padova has at one point sat on one of those lions and pretended they were riding on them. So uh, just an interesting fact there. Well, right now I'm right under the palazzo that separates Piazza d'Erbe from Piazza Frutti. And you have this long archway here that you can see. And this is a market of m meat, fish, cheeses, etc. Uh, and on the other side of the palazzo, you have an identical kind of market selling all the same kind of stuff. This market's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's a big tradition here. and uh, It's really cool. You get all the finest quality meats, fish, cheese. But one of my favorite things here is just over my shoulder there. I don't know if it's open yet. There's a, <laughs> there's a late night tartare place that make you up tartars, various different kinds of tartars. You know, you get the munchies, you walk out of the pub in Dublin, you want fish and chips, or you, you stumble out of a bar in New York City and you want a nice pizza slice. Well, the Padovani come out of the pub with the munchies and they go for tartare. <laughs> I have actually tried it late at night after a uh, long pub crawl, it does not satisfy the munchies. Well, right behind me here, that up there, um, above my left shoulder, 
is the clock tower looking down over the Piazza di Signori up there. It's very beautiful. And if you take a closer look, it's quite magnificent. It has all the zodiac symbols all the way around the clock, which is really, really nice. However, in classic Padova style, it is missing one. It's without, it's senza one sign. Legend has it that the artist who created the clock discovered before finishing it, discovered he wasn't going to get paid in completion. So in an act of vengeance, he omitted the Libra sign, which of course is the sign for justice. <laughs> the, the weighing scales, the balance. <laughs> so that was his way of getting justice against his cheap, nasty contractors who weren't going to pay him. Also, while I'm here, I want to do a little review on my 116613, my beloved uh, two-tone Submariner. To tone or not to tone? That is the question. I really love this watch, so maybe you will after this video. And here she is, the wonderful and elusive two-tone Submariner. The 116613 LN, Lunette Noir. If I say that a bit more French, Lunette Noir. Um, <laughs> that's my best attempt. There is another version of this watch that has uh, Lunette Blue LB, commonly known as the Bluesy. It has blue ceramic bezel and blue dial. And it is a more popular version because the blue iteration has been around for quite some time and is a kind of a favorite out there. And the black and gold is a little bit kind of, um, I won't say ignored, but it's, it's kind of the lesser known uh, brother. It has a beautiful, deep, rich black to it, as you can see. Now, one difference between the Lunette Blue and the Lunette Noir version is that on the dial, on the bluesy, Let's keep calling it the Bluesy because that's its nickname, very famous nickname. The writing on the dial is also gold. So it matches with the gold dressing around the gold around the indices, the gold hands and the gold, of course, in the bezel, etc. And the blue and the gold do actually look quite beautiful. Whereas on the black, rather than having gold writing, they just stuck with the white. So the writing is just like the regular the regular Submariner, uh, the stainless steel one, which of course I have here. Many of you saw me unbox this one um, the other week. Again, white writing on this one. So almost uh, identical dials. However, this has white gold around the indices and on the hands to avoid corrosion. The two-tone has yellow gold, 18 karat yellow gold around the indices and on the hands avoiding corrosion also, and kind of completing the gold look of the watch. Now, in every other way, it's identical measurements wise and so on, 40 millimeters across, across here, about 44, 45, if you include the crown and, and crown guards. It is, of course, the uh, super case or maxi case, depending on which uh, phrase you like to use for that. And of course, it has the uh, maxi dial so large indices and slightly thicker hands easier to read the loom on this of course is chromolite and around 2014 2015 they were migrating from uh super luminova which has a kind of a green hue to it uh over to chromolite which has more of a bluey green hue to it so what really makes it two-tone of course it being gold and steel. So where is the gold? It's all around the bezel, as you can see. It's in the indices, in the ceramic or cerachrome uh, bezel. It's on the dial. So all the indices on the dial and the hands are gold. The crown, of course, is gold. And gold goes through the entire center links of the bracelet. And that includes, of course, the clasp. Fully gold, beautiful. Let's have a look at the clasp itself. As you can see, gold going all the way through. But inside, of course, here we just have stainless steel. So, of course, it has, just like the regular 
Submariner in stainless steel. It has the glide lock system. Very, very smooth, very beautiful. Works like a dream. Absolute creamy movement on it. Absolutely gorgeous. And snaps closed beautifully. So why do I love this watch? Well, I have a weakness for black and gold. I think black and gold is a beautiful combo. And uh, even in the old version, the aluminum bezel version or aluminium, if you're from uh, England, um, the that version also has a beautiful, powerful look to it too. I like this one because it's a little less seen around than the bluesy. As you guys know, I like to have a little bit of individuality. Uh, you know, you might scoff at that comment because I've got this thing and there's pretty much nothing individual about this other than the fact that it's a very expensive watch. But for me, it's always nice to have something. I've said this about my Yachtmaster 40, that that watch uh, has a uniqueness to it because you don't see them around very much. And I will say the same thing about this. I don't see every second guy with a two-tone black dial and black bezel um, Submariner. Now, there have been rumors recently, as many of you may have heard, that the Submariner design is getting a bit of an overhaul for Baselworld in 2020. There's no uh, way of confirming that, but that's the word on the street. People are saying that they may be reducing the size of the lugs and may be making the super case or maxi case, whichever you want to say, a little less maxi, a little less super. That's also very good news for guys like me who own these two models because it means these exact designs will be out of production. So that means that, sure, this one will continue to go up in value uh, for the obvious reasons. It's the stainless steel one everybody wants. But it also means this one will go up in value because it's no longer being made. It's harder to get then. And if it's in excellent condition, it's, uh, it's, it's going to definitely increase in value over time. I consider this watch a nighttime watch. I think it really comes alive in nighttime situations. It's a watch for going out to a cool restaurant, a cool club, uh, going shopping uh, and, and things like that. And being in an artificial environment where there are LED lights and so on around that are just going to make this watch sparkle. It just it picks up light beautifully, especially in the evening and, and nighttime. It is a very masculine watch and, and has a lot of power to it. So if you have a slender wrist or more kind of feminine shaped wrist or whatever, this might not really um, fly on your wrist, to be honest. It's a little bit too like 45 Magnum kind of shape. It's kind of really bulky and extra masculine. If you're looking for something that fits a, a bit more elegantly on your wrist, maybe go for the Explorer the uh, not the Explorer 2, but the Explorer 1, as many people say, the regular Explorer, or maybe go for the Yachtmaster 40, which in one of my other videos I explain is a much more elegant style of watch. Or if you can afford it, the Daytona, which of course carries its own elegance. This, on the other hand, is undeniably a powerful looking watch. It's extremely masculine and pounds its chest. Just beware of that, that the watch isn't going to sit quietly on your wrist. It's going to scream at people a little bit. Uh, it just has that undeniable attention-grabbing uh, quality to it. So let's take one last look at this absolute beauty in the ancient and wonderful academic city of Padova. Thanks for watching, guys.